Hello everyone and welcome to today's keynote webinar titled Improving Research Translation in Dementia, Humanized Mouse Models, Cognition and Imaging. This webinar is part of the 11th annual event in the Neuroscience Virtual Event Series. And I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots. So let's get started. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that this event is interactive, and we encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using our live chat feature during this presentation. You can find that live chat located on the left of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you'd like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of this presentation. Now, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just simply click on the help desk button located at the top of your screen within the navigation bar or from the lobby. And finally, as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on that continuing education credits link located in the abstract tab from the menu at the left of the screen and follow the process to obtain those credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Marco Prado, a Canada Research Chair in Neurochemistry of Dementia and a scientist at Robarts Research Institute and professor at the University of Western Ontario. For a complete biography of our speakers, please visit the presenter tab from the menu at the left of your screen. Dr. Prado, welcome. You may now begin your presentation, sir. Thank, thanks, Suzy. So it's my pleasure to be here. And um, I want to first so just uh, thank LabRoots and for, for this invitation. And also congratulate all the women that are uh, participating for the International Day of Women. Um, um, and, uh, you know, my lab is run by uh, the women and, and I have great women collaborators and I'll try to highlight their work today. Um, I'm interested in translational research, and particularly in how we can improve uh, basic research to facilitate translation uh, clinical trials. And this is just sort of a summary that uh, uh, was used in the pharmaceutical research manufacturers America and report. And that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of the magnitude of the problem in terms of uh, discovering new drugs. And this is particularly problematic of brain, and even worse for dementia and, and, and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and you can see that, you know, there, there's an obvious price tag on, on, on most of this. What you can see here is that um, there's a lot of compounds that need to be screened. And then, you know, there's a lot of preclinical testing that has to happen before you do clinical trials. And the problem is really that some of that preclinical testing does not easily translate to clinical trials. And obviously, clinical trials are much, much more expensive than preclinical testing. So there is ways that we could better predict which compounds or which drugs that are effective in, for example, animal models would be successful in clinical trials. That would be uh, a really an amazing way to, um, you know, perhaps uh, um, fail those drugs really before you move to clinical trials and save quite a bit on, on, on the expenses of those clinical trials. And obviously there is a whole bunch of reviews that, that come up so, so drug gets to the market. So uh, where the arrow is, is where I'm interested is in improving that system and give you a couple of examples of what we've been doing to, to do this. And then just a reminder that, for example, for Alzheimer's disease, there is really no drug recently that has been approved. And there's quite a bit of controversy on the approval, uh, for example, of aducanumab and now lecanemab, uh, which is a bit more promising uh, and, and in terms of um, uh, um, uh, treatment, but still not uh, to the level. But they actually do what they are supposed to do. They um, clear the brain of, of Alzheimer's pathology, but the improvement in cognition is somewhat um, underwhelming. And that obviously is what patients complain, right? If you have Alzheimer's disease, you're complaining of issues of cognitive, of cognition, of memory, and that, that's your problem. So how we do that sort of preclinical research in the dementia field or neurodegeneration, 
most of what we do uses mice, and, and, and I stole this a lot from a from, uh, um, foundation that uh, uh, highlights how important the laboratory mouse is for research in life sciences. And it just gives an idea how many genes um, we can manipulate the most genome. Uh, in a, in a quite a remarkable way and generate different mouse models for different diseases, uh, for Alzheimer's, for uh, Parkinson's disease. Obviously, you know, this is a work in progress. Uh, what I consideration of mouse models were transgenic mouse models. Uh, and we'll see now that we're evolving to mouse models where we have knocking the um, human genes sometimes in the mouse genome and, and try to uh, improve those mouse models. So, so the first thing that we think about this is the sort of model. And, you know, as George Box stated, um, um, no model is useful. I mean, no model, is, all models are wrong. Right? And, and mice are obviously not human, but we can learn quite a bit of uh, uh, disease process and pathology in mice, and we hope that we can also learn about how pathology affects, for example, cognition and uh, structure. So what are the issues? So I, I just raised one issue is, you know, we, we do need better mouse models. We need mouse models that better reflect the disease, and we're going to give you a few examples how we're doing this. I'm part of a, a, a large consortium of mouse trap and a partnership between my university, University of Western Ontario, and McGill University to do th that sort of improvement and how we evaluate uh, drugs and, and develop methodologies for this. So um, in terms of measurements that you can do in, in models of Alzheimer's disease, other dementia, you know, the current approach is really to use behavior tests that might be in relevant for because they have to escape something or they get some sort of, uh, you know, they're afraid of something and you measure that, that sort of fear. But they're not translatable for humans. So, so, for example, the most common sort of test for memory mice in, in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease is either fear condition, uh, you know, sort of fear based memory, or uh, something called the Morris water maze, which is uh, pool where mice are put in the main pool and they have to escape. And obviously, you don't do that in Alzheimer's disease, right? You don't throw Alzheimer's patients in the swimming pool and ask to figure out how to, they get out. There's a huge component of stress there. Moreover, uh, in, in the pre you know, one of the things that we don't do is, is the sort of imaging that you can do in, um, uh, in humans, for example, using sophisticated MRI technology. I mean, we do it, but it's not a common thing to do. Mostly we rely on biochemical markers and sort of pathology we doubt for this neurodegenerative disease in mouse models. And we think we can do better than that. You know, we if you think about um, models of dementia is really in, in cognitive dysfunction, you, you want to test something that can reflect what you see in humans, which is the cognitive function that affects daily living. But how, how do you do that in a mouse? Obviously, you can't ask the mouse about this. So you also want to do something that's related, that it's relevant and may be relevant for the human condition as well. Uh, you, want, you want a test that is reproducible and can be easily reproduced between labs and, and, and it provides enough power to understand uh, the cognitive functions that you're interested in. You want automation and Potentially, you want some sort of standardization as well, so different laboratories can do this and can use it. Over, you'd like some sort of medium to high throughput, so you can assess multiple mouse models, multiple drugs. You want to do some sort of imaging that's relevant to use humans and may serve as translatable biomarkers, and same thing for the cognition, right? So, so in terms of uh, uh, translational measurements, what we use in our um, approach here is a set of touchscreen tasks. So the, this is basically iPads for mice. Um, so the mice have to touch the screen. And there is over 30 validated tasks that have my colleagues, Tim Bussey and Lisa Saxida, my colleagues from the University of Western Ontario. And the, the, so there's uh, all, completely automated. Computer takes over and tests the mice. Uh, the standard results can be provided by the computer, but most important, most uh, 
tests are identical to human tests. That we can test humans and mice with absolutely the same task. The sort of image we do, for example, it's a high field uh, MRI, and we can do uh, a, a number of unbiased whole brain analysis with uh, experts in um, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So just to, to give you a quick example, this example is a touch screen task that is developed for mice and used in mice, and they, those are based in the, in, in the cash uh, sort of um, uh, battery of tests, and, and that's what the advantage of those touch screens because you plug battery tests similar to humans. You don't do, you, you don't need to do just one task. of them. And this particular one, my colleagues tested mice uh, in this task, the mice that have a mutation that cause is needed to free, uh, fail this task, and then the test humans in the same sort of test that's on on on, on the left, and. Um, you can see that the humans that had the same patient that were reduced in mice also failed in the same test. So they're translatable and they have some of the uh, uh, changes in cognition. So I'm gonna focus in two examples. I'm gonna focus on um, synuclein pathologies such as Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy body. That's gonna be my, my main example on how we're developing this sort of translational approach. I'll give you a little bit of uh, on Alzheimer's at the end of it as well. And synucleinopathies are really uh, diseases where uh, a protein called synuclein or alpha synuclein misfits. So alpha synuclein normally is involved with synaptic vesicles and synaptic transmission. And we don't know what it does, but in Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy body, uh, multiple system atrophy, and a number of other diseases, that protein changes conformation, it starts to make conclusions, eventually forms oligomers and, and, and ag aggregates, and they are so-called those body and Lewy neurites are, are formed by this meso uh, and, and aggregated um, synuclein. And that obviously, so that's one of the main features of a number of uh, patients with Parkinson's disease, the main issue with Lewy as well. So we think synuclein Synuclines are, are, are an important component. There is quite a bit of uh, human and, and, and preclinical research evidence. So this is um, a paper from, from a few years ago and, and actually shows something that is now quite common for this neurogenesis, is, is that this pathology uh, can transfer from cell to cell in what we call a prion-like behavior. Prions are those proteins that we fold and cause prion disease like crossfeld yakov disease. So Parkinson's disease is not a prion disease, but it behaves a bit like a prion as the pathology progresses through the brain. And this is an example of this sort of experiments where uh, uh, actually uh, what people did here, what researchers did here, uh, uh, led, led by uh, uh, Patrick Brody, uh, was to uh, grab uh, tissue from, from uh, you know, fetus, fetal tissue to be placed to pulmonary neurons that are lost in, par lost in Parkinson's disease. So this is one of the main components of Parkinson's disease. Uh, dopamine neurons die and affect movement, affects cognition, affects a number. So they graft uh, uh, fetal tissue that would potentially secrete Parkinson's disease. But what they found is that, the, you know, the pathology from the host actually was present also died in, in the graft tissue as well. And um, if you look at uh, uh, synuclein, it's a small protein, but that you can have markers of that misfolding. For example, synuclein may, may be phosphorylated uh, in one specific residue, uh, um, serine 29, and that is a marker of sort of misfolded and aggregated synuclein. We don't know if that's sort of toxic or not, we know that you know most of us use this model. So if you look at the brain here uh, and uh, that scheme of the brain and the, uh, you know this whole uh, pathology uh, stage that Brack and Brack described, uh, where the pathology is moving on the brain stem and it's moving towards the cortex and you know affecting the cortex. And obviously, when it gets to uh, uh, some of the major centers, that's when the symptoms start to appear. Uh, and this is a case of, of synucleinopathies such as Parkinson's disease, but it's somewhat similar for Alzheimer's disease and, and other diseases as well. There's the big problem here. So somehow these proteins that normally work to facilitate how our brain cells communicate, they change conformation, 
they, they are normally folded, they misfold, and somehow they form these inclusions, they start to aggregate, they can transfer from neuron to neuron, and they can spread to connected pathways in the brain. So how does that uh, happen? Um, you know, one possibility is that proteins named molecular chaperones participate in this process. Molecular chaperones are a set of proteins that um, are involved in molding and uh, uh, organization of large proteins complex. So one of the best examples is the uh, heat shock protein and in heat shock protein 90 uh, chaperone pathways where you have a number of other proteins called chaperones that participate in this cycle. And those sh molecular chaperones help to maintain proteins folded, but they can also have to uh, 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 support them to be either degraded or, or destroyed. And, and it's important that this chaperones function uh, really, really well. And, and, and I mentioned the last example is the heat shock protein 90, which is a, a dimer and interacts with the, what we call client proteins, such as, you know, synuclein. And there is evidence that the shadows are important for synuclein. There is a paper that uh, was published a few years ago uh, by Sebastian Peter and others. And in this paper, they show that synuclein is either located at the membrane of vesicles or other types of membrane, but if it's in the cytoplasm cell, it's, it's probably complex with, with, uh, with chaperones. So it complex with uh, heat shock protein. That led us to ask the question whether these chaperones might be affected in parts of disease. And this is a collaboration we did with uh, Mona Sorek at the Hebrew University of Minnesota. And, and she looked at the number of those chaperones and co chaperones on top. And in the left are the chaperones and co chaperones that have um, different expression. They are increased in the of people that have died of Parkinson's disease. And in light, we have chaperones that don't, don't change that much. We also look at the base and look at how chaperones uh, correlate with synuclein. And all those chaperones on, chaperone, co -chaperones on the left, on the lower column, they, 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 they do show some correlation with, with synuclein, but because they change from uh, uh, expression, the, that correlation is not as strong as the chaperones that don't uh, change expression in the in, in Parkinson's disease. And we're particularly interested in one of those four chaperones called um, stress inducible phosphor protein 1 or STIP1 or STI1. There's different names for this protein. And, and it's a critical protein that actually uh, regulates uh, the uh, transfer of proteins between uh, heat shock protein 7 and heat shock protein 19. And it's important for the function of this molecular. Protein. So we're interested to see whether this protein would, would be participate somehow with synuclein and it would be regulating chaperones. And what we did was to ask the question whether there is some sort of interaction between A1 and, and, and alpha synuclein, because you know there was this report that chaperones interact with alpha synuclein. And we did find that um, we co-immunoprecipitate STI1, which is shown here uh, in this Western plot, we also Precipitate mouse mouse synuclein, and we also co immunoprecipitate heat shock protein 90 as, as a complex. So obviously, this just says that um, STI1 is in a complex with with uh, uh, alpha synuclein. It doesn't tell us that it interacts directly, but that we did um, the colleague uh, named James Troy, a biochemist, and he used nuclear magnetic resonance uh, to look at uh, chips in proteins. So we label proteins. I'm not going to go in detail on how this is done, but we basically label proteins and put those proteins together and um, see changes, chemical shifts changes in one protein, in this case, in the nuclein, when we try to take this layer. And we see that is happening, basically what this uh, cartoon is showing, is that the C terminals of, of uh, interacts with one of the domains of STI1 called the TPR2A domains. Uh, with a lot of other experiments, no other domain of STI1 interacts with, with uh, synuclein. And if we do the reverse experiment, we see that is the TPR2A domain that it changes also on STI1 when interact with synuclein. So there is direct interaction. So we're interested in looking at this in vivo because remember, we want to see whether uh, we can do better cognition and better imaging, and, and, and may be able to better predict how these uh, uh, pathways work.
for a clinical trial. Um, we use a model of alpha cyanocline called the um, uh, A53T, uh, M83 mice, which is uh, alpha cyanocline uh, that is a human alpha cyanocline is a transgenic mouse. Uh, if you have two copies of that, that transgene, mouse uh, develops a spontaneous disease, and in the Western plot, you can see. So when I uh, I have this M83 homozygous mice, I'll have M83 plus, and I'll have a mouse without any sort of uh, marker there. Um, and you can see that, for example, if you look at um, um, correlation of cyanucleine 129, which is the middle of this Western plot, you see that M83 mice uh, have. Uh, 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 more phosphorylation of this marker, and they have STL1. Obviously, we, we, we labeled for everything else. We use the same sort of mouse model with one copy of, uh, of uh, alpha cyanocline, so we can have two copies or one copy of the trinity. And in this case, this copy, what we do is we can inject, and you can see here uh, in this cartoon, we inject what we call preformed fibers of human cyanocline basically serves as a seed and template to change the conformation of synuclein. And you can have an, a, this sort of, uh, to mimic this prion-like behavior, where you have different strains of synuclein that can be injected in the brain. So M83 has mice, so that has one copy. It doesn't have any abnormalities until they're really, really old, but we can see this pathology and you can see here, uh, what you can see is in the top uh, blue uh, um, micrography is mice that work with PBS. You see nothing there. And in that way, with this preformed fibers, we can detect the uh, phosphorylated synuclein, and that you see in red here, and you can see that spread. So we inject in one side of the brain, and it, 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 it basically, from where that seed is injected in the striatum, in the striatum it uh, goes to connected pathways to different brain areas. So go to connected pathways to different brain areas, and we can detect the misfolded alpha synuclein with the phosphorylated alpha synuclein that is uh, fluorescent in red here. And you can look at this in more details, and you can see that the phosphorylated synuclein here in red um, uh, in neurons and different brain regions, uh, it co-localizes with inclusions of ubiquity, is with uh, heat shock protein 90 and STL1. So when I have the mouse model that we injected PFS or preformed fibrils, I'll have the, the cartoon of mouse with a little injection on top. So you know which one I'm talking about. So um, the first thing we ask, you know, obviously we saw patients that this uh, uh, chaperones are somehow increased, you know, what's happening in the mice. And what we found and to make a really long story short, is that um, chaperones seem to be abnormal in this mouse models of synucleopathy. And you, you can ignore the plots and just go to the graphs. And in these graphs, you can see that in all these mouse models, this uh, uh, chaperones, such as heat shock protein 90 and STI1, are increased levels. But this is aggregated chaperone. So this is a of aggregated protein. So these chaperones are now aggregating. So they, they seem to be abnormal. This is in the homozygous mice. If we do PFF mice, we also see that sort of uh, same sort of thing where, where in the aggregated form, this chaperone increase, which would should not be increased. Um, so the question we ask them is uh, uh, really, you know, if we have uh, this normal chaperones, so maybe we need to replace them. They're not working really well. You know, what happens if we increase the levels of this protein called STI1? And we did this in, in different ways, but, you know, basically what happens is that pathology actually got worse. If we had more STI1, in this case, we also had more uh, heat shock protein 90. It is a transgenic mouse model we made a few years ago, and we crossed them with the M83 them with with, uh, with this PFS, and we saw you can compare the left and the right, and in the right you can see way more red because there is more pathology. Uh, we can see that individual neurons as well there is more pathology, and we can quantify this, and you know the quantification shows the same thing. We quantify it by Western blots, and you can see here in Western blots that if you look at this 129, this synuclein 129, it if you have more mice that have more. STI1 and more, HP90, there is more of this um, uh, 
labels this aggregated inclusion least folded symmetry. Um, we see this both in the soluble fractions, but also fractions as well. So really suggesting that that there is um, you know some sort of abnormality going on. Uh, we can um, do uh, uh, the sort of experiment now in vitro to try to understand how this is happening. And in this particular one, it was again this far. What we did here is, is that we phosphorylated alpha synuclein in this region 129. So what you see in the square in the middle where the 129 residue should be reflected in the plot, but you can see that it's right in the left because it's fully phosphorylated, and the phosphorylated protein can still interact and even interact a bit better with STI1. And what we did one in vitro experiment that turned out to be quite interesting, where we put uh, this domain of STI1 that interacts with synuclein, and we phosphorylated synuclein in vitro. And what we found, and you can look at the graph here to, to see this, is that when we put the right domain that interacts with synuclein, which is this uh, TPR domain, we increase the levels of phosphorylation of synuclein in vitro, suggesting that somehow uh, STI1 can hold uh, synuclein in a conformation that favors that, that pathological or, or, or the abnormal phosphorylation, that, that uh, increase in that normal phosphorylation. So we um, uh, obviously ask the question that if increased levels of STI1 are facilitated, Increasing sort of pathology is decreased levels doing the inverse. And obviously, the answer is, it is. Uh, and this is again the quantification. If you look at the red, you can see the normal sort of uh, uh, preformed fiber injected mice um, have, whereas the mice that have, in this case, is a mice that have about 80% decreased levels of a mutated STI1. So, those of one, you can see that uh, in the right that there is way less of the red marker of pathology. So that allows us to think, okay, well, obviously we, we got to quantify this, we, we, we do the western blot again, and, and you don't have again to worry about the western blots, just to show you, you know, the quantification of the western blot shows that, you know, you can decrease quite a bit of pathology um, if you have one or two copies of the mutated S. Basically, what I'm telling you is that if you increase levels of STI1, you're increase, increasing pathology. If you're decreasing the levels of STI1, you are decreasing pathology. Okay? So, so what I've told you so far, and, and it's just sort of a preparation to tell you how we now hope to look at this and in ways that will facilitate uh, uh, translation measures uh, between these model models and people with dementia. So just as a reminder then, um, so we have this uh, clean, uh, we have mouse model of synuclein that overexpress human synuclein, depending if it overexpress a lot, it develops spontaneous disease. If it doesn't overexpress a lot, we can uh, trigger disease by injecting this uh, formed fibers or PFF, human synuclein, exactly like a seed, uh, changes in formation. And we think that the HSP90 and str one they act together um, uh, um, to basically regulate this process and facilitate phosphorylation by this uh, kind of, of this, this abnormal phosphorylation. At the same time, this, these chaperones are uh, abnormally in, in this disease, and they sort of act together with alpha synuclein in, in this uh, sort of inclusions that we detect in mice. So, so how do we detect this and how do we move with this? So, so we want to look at early biomarkers, and I mentioned this about the touch screens. We, I mentioned this about sort of imaging. I'm not going to talk about this. You know, in a way, we want to also um, maximize chances by using different models, not just models. In the case of, of the group that I'm working in, the consortium that we work, we use the common marmoset as a model as well. And I'm not going to show you the, the developing the marmoset models of synucleinopathy right now. So uh, just to give an idea, uh, this is a paper that submitted and, and uh, inject the PFF like we did, the preformed fiber. We inject changes in brain uh, gray matter, atrophy of the brain, after about uh, three months in a mice, and we can actually do this longitudinally with the live mice as well. This is a collaboration with my colleague Malar Chakravati, but it's really driven 
uh, Stephanie Tung, one of his grad students. And we also in my lab detected um, uh, using the screen tasks, detected cognitive uh, dysfunction, and that would be the lower back of this graph, cognitive dysfunction that is very early, about 30 uh, days after the infections of PFS. So when progression of the pathology is happening. So on top of uh, on the top here is different motor tasks that we did. This and we this mice are absolutely normal by 30 days in the motor tasks, but we can already detect um, a cognitive deficit. In particular task, which is pairwise visual discrimination and reversal learning, uh, we show the mice two different images and we reward one of them. So really nice um, shot of strawberry milkshake if they get it right. If they don't get it right, they don't get it. So they sort of get punished by some tone and some noise. Um, and you can see that they, they learn how to discriminate those two images. And the first time they do, you know, uh, both the control and the PFF, which is in pink, they are the same. They do the same, but when we go and reverse the contingence, that is, we change. Now we reward the other image. So we, let's say we're rewarding first uh, the left image, and then uh, we we start rewarding the right image, the star, right? So called uh, fan. And and when we do this, you know, and we've seen the the the, the graph here uh, is there's a difference, and in the real learning to differentiate those two images and the um, mice injected with PFF do worse. And, uh, and I'll show you this in, in a different way in, in another experiments and, and point to you to the paper that we just published with this data. So, uh, this is a paper that was published recently in ACTA Neuropathic uh, has all this data that I mentioned to you. So so again, this is the sort of test that we do. So we have this, uh, what we call fan and and so during acquisition, and here we have you know, control mice, wild type mice, MAD3 mice that have uh, um, that have two copies of, 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 of the transgene, and MAD3 mice that have less STR1 in blue. So, uh, sorry, so in blue is the MAD3 mice that has two copies of so the transgenic mice, and in, um, um, in pink we have the MAD3 mice that have less STR1. So if we ask them to learn which of those two images gives the reward, they learn in, in few trials, you know, takes a few days, but they learn and they, their performance is the same. But you can see the reversal learning when they are, you know, on the top, they are in accuracy about 80, means that they are getting 80 more of them, right? And then we change the contingents. Now we start rewarding the other image. And they have to learn that the other image now is going to give them strawberry. Obviously, in the beginning, they fail completely, and then they get maybe one or two right. But they started to relearn this, and obviously, they, they more to do it. They relearn, oh, no, that now it's the other image that, that does it. So hey, they have to inhibit their behavior of touching the image they were touching before and touch the new image. You can see that control mice do this quite well. The, uh, the blue line where you have the you can see that they have a deficit compared to the control mice. And you can see that if the uh, transgenic mice have one less copy of ST1, so they have lower levels of ST1, we can mitigate that cognitive deficit. Not only that, if we look at the imaging, MRI imaging, look at atrophy, again, we can see it and, and, and we can just look at the graphs and see what we're showing here is that in the blue is that the transgenic mice have atrophy certain brain regions um, that are similar to what you expect to see in, in, in um, uh, people with synaptic and if, But if you have uh, reduced levels of ST1, you sort of mitigate that atrophy. And these are the same mice that did the cognitive testing. So suggesting that now that, um, uh, that by decreasing the levels of ST1, we can mitigate not just the but we can mitigate cognitive deficits that are very relevant for human synucleinopathies. That's that sort of executive dysfunction learning is the sort of thing that you expect to see in, in, in patients with, with the dementia with Lewy body and, and even some Parkinson's patients. So what does that take us? So one of the uh, uh, things that is happening, and I mentioned, is that this chaperones or chaperones be affected. There is a, a hypothesis that was um, uh, raised by one of my collaborators, Gabriela Kiosis, that suggests that aging and protein misfolding, the whole chaperone system is affected and is, is behaving abnormally. And she calls it 
epichaperone. So they're highly connected and they seem to uh, somehow, this abnormal chaperone seem to hold proteins that that of help, helping them to be destroyed. So they don't work as well as they should work. And she developed a number of approaches, including a drug that could be used to disrupt this abnormal epichaperone. So, so basically this chaperone that is highly connected, and you can see that STM is one of the key nodes that connects this whole thing together. So uh, uh, Gabriela showed that if you knock down STL1, you can from. And if you use a drug that interacts with the HSP90, that facilitates the HSP90 that is in this epichaperone, uh, you can also block this epichaperone. So there is a drug called PUAD that does that. It's a drug that is actually on clinical trials for uh, Alzheimer's disease. And the first um, um, phase of the clinical trial has just been reported a few months ago and showing that this drug is safe for it's, it you know has the right pharmacokinetics, um, so it's this epichaperone inhibitor, and the drug is from here, so it's called. And, and the idea is that it will interact with this epichaperone with HSP90 and and disrupt this epichaperone. So we asked the question why perhaps or uh, you know this drug, since we've seen that chaperones are affected also in Parkinson's disease and or, or synucleinopathy mouse models, would that affect uh, cognitive? And these are preliminary results, but you know, using the same sort of uh, reversal learning testing that we did, and you're showing here the reversal learning top, and this is done in male and female mice, and you can see that in green is the mice that have been injected with this preformed files, and they have obviously the density that we detected before. We can reproduce this, but if they have treated with this drug um, that. That, that interferes with the chaperone, you can see that we can mitigate this cognitive testing. So obviously this is just a small step uh, where, you know, our pipeline would indicate that we have to look at this more careful. We're gonna do a number of other experiments, we're testing a number of other controls. Uh, we're testing different mouse models of synucleinopathy. And if this drug really uh, improves cognition, and the second cognitive task that we're doing that also um, um, response to this preformed fibers. And by the way, I mean, we've tested different preformed fibers. We tested our preformed fibers. We test for a company called Stress Marker, and it works in the same way as well. Uh, so, so it seems to be quite a robust finding that the cognition goes first and we can detect this cognitive deficits. Uh, so, once we, we, we fully validate this mice, perhaps in organoids, then we may move to than to uh, the marmoset, and that will be the ultimate proof. So marmosets obviously depend on being close, closer to humans. The immune system is much, much closer to humans, and we can now, so we're already doing the sort of same cognitive test in and um, and mice, and we can do humans as well. So I just want to uh, start start to finish this about five minutes to give you a take home match and, and, and a quick other example. So, so ST1 is, is major play interacts with the protein, um, but we, we do think that it's participating in, in the misfolding of, of, of alpha synuclein and seems to be this epi chaperone. I think that this epi chaperone may be a potential therapeutic and even diagnostic for synucleinopathy. So this is just one example. Uh, quickly, going to move to a second example um, in Alzheimer's disease, and and just to, I'm not going to give you any details. For example, in terms of better mouse models, we have generated mouse models where we have um, um, mutated APP, which is the amyloid precursor protein that reproduce some of the familiar forms of Alzheimer's disease. We have mice that have also human. And this has not been generated by us, but by others. And also, uh, and, and one of the uh, really important resources is the Model A uh, consortium in the US and, and, and RICAN as well, and, and APOE3 and APOE4. But what we did was we combined all the one mouse model, or actually different mouse models. So we have mice that have mutated or not mutated APP. They have tau. It's important to have human tau because you have different uh, Tau forms, and uh, you have the biggest risk for Alzheimer's disease which is ApoE4, uh, and, and the normal risk which is ApoE3. And we, you know, one thing that we're doing not just uh, 
generate these mice, but then we go and test them in a battery of these cognitive touchscreen tests. We test in a battery of imaging modalities, and 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 then we, you know, and this is some models that this consortium has tested so far, and some of the cognitive platforms that we've used. Um, we do our open science initiative, and uh, we have different ways to foster open science. We have something called touchscreencognition.org that you know it's for all the members of the community that use this touch screen there's about 400 laboratories in the world including a number of pharmaceutical companies and this is really to share knowledge and uh, standard operating procedures for touch screens we also have a data sharing platform called mousepass and i urge you to check it out uh, through www.mousebytes.ca and i mean we published a few years ago an uh, eLife and this is part of what we call a mousetrap platform, so mouse transmission research accelerator platform that provides uh, support for researchers to test their uh, a mouse model, to test the, the drug. So you can see the open access, be free. Anybody can be uh, can download all the data sets uh, that are pub public. Uh, there is only individual mice registered with their cognitive data at the ball in this uh, uh, database. And this is just an example of the users of people that use this mouse by uh, technology or, or, or platform to um, um, download a, a, a data set. So uh, the advantage of those touch screens is that you really can have um, uh, some sort of standardization without needing to have a commercial together, right? So people all over the world can use the same apparatus and same sort of uh, 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 standard operating procedures or, uh, types of data sets. And uh, I mean, the touch screens are commercially available, but we also work in a potential uh, open source touch screen. There are others that have worked on, on open source touch screen. This led to uh, a, re a recent initiative, a partnership that we have with so similar to what people do in clinical trials, we want to, like, it, it, it's gone the days that one scientist is going to do experiments in the lab. So we have this as a multi-site uh, uh, sort of facility. So we have a partnership with McGee University, and we have you know, testing drugs and organoids. So it's called the Translation Initiative to do risk Neurotherapeutics, and make it safer to move to clinical trials. And not safer in terms of, you know, uh, potential harm, but safer in terms of better chance of, of these drugs uh, in humans when we pass to this pipeline, which is uh, uh, patient organoids, uh, testing mice, and it's a pyramid. Obviously, the moment is what we think is really, really promising, and we do this through imaging, cognition, and through open science as well. Uh, just going to finish here. So. Um, this obviously hopefully will lead, you know, this is a test platform. And hopefully when we finish this project in a few years, we'll know this better chance of successful clinical trials. So our measure of success, so this is really our ongoing, but you know, it's increased reproducibility. We've done a different lab and this that's really and MRI as well have a really high rate of reproducibility. We can, you know, people can crowdsource data, can reuse the data, so follow the fair principles of, of open science, uh, increased access to open science. Uh, we hope there's going to be better understanding of the secrets and pathologies that are involved in cognition, um, the platforms for drug testing, and synergize the efforts for, for, for better understand how these drugs uh, could predict the success of this drug for clinical trial. So um, that's pretty much it. I want to just thank the people that have been involved with this. And because today is the day for women, I I want to really give a shout out to the major people that were involved, um, including my partner um, in Life Lab, uh, who, who directs this program with me, uh, Rachel Lackey, who is a grad student uh, who graduated last year. She most of what we've done with Synuclein and led the project. Alini Miranda is a professor in Brazil, but was a postdoc in the lab, and she did a lot of behavior. Uh, Anusha Turan is a current postdoc that is following up with this project. Lisa Saxida is from the from the duo Basi is is another great collaboration. Mona Sorek, another of the amazing women that I have the privilege to collaborate. My collaborator, 
poses in, in, in New York that has provided us with the drug and insight on happy chaperones, and Sarah Memar as well, who um, uh, developed this uh, mouse bites uh, platform. And um, I just, uh, you know, obviously a number of other people have been involved and, and you know, shout out, they all there, uh, they have different levels of involvement as well, but I, I thought I'd just shout out for the women that have been participating in the project. Some of the major initiatives uh, have been funded uh, by a number of organizations in Canada International. Uh, it's our disclosure, and I'd be really happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Dr. Prado, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started. It looks like we already have some great questions coming in. Our first question, Dr. Prado, <clears throat> from our audience, he said, uh, I understand that this gas has been personalized in case of AD, but is there an impossibility, a possibility for the same therapeutic to be available for other neurodegenerative disorders like MS or ALS? Uh, that's a really excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, so, so the concept of epichaperones is also um, is also being studied in other neurodegenerative diseases, not in. in sclerosis, but in, in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, yes, um, which is a pro, uh, uh, also misfolding. Um, this, in, in that case, there's other proteins that misfold, such as FUS. TDP43 is a major misfolded protein. Uh, chaperones are important for TDP43 as well, and um, it's it's not being tested yet. But it's There is potential that this sort of uh, epichaperone could be uh, used for other neurodegenerative diseases as well. Uh, the platform and, and, and the sort of pipeline that, that we um, put towards Alzheimer's or towards uh, synucleinopathy, such as uh, um, parts of this can be adapted for other diseases as well. And, and we do have different models of uh, ALS or frontotemporal dementia, which is sort of affecting ALS. Uh, and it's evolved mutations of TDP43. So we have, and we have tested some of these mouse models, this line as well. So, uh, you know, obviously there is a capacity issue, but we, uh, you know, having the capacity, we, we nowadays I feel that we test in the touch screens, for example, about five to 800 mice every day, right? And, and this is evolving different projects, new models and testing drugs like I, I, I um, Pointed out, so yeah, so there is a, a lot of potential for other diseases as well, not just the uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, Parkinson's disease. Thank you so much. And how can how can one access the facilities you mentioned in your talk? Yeah, so, so you know we are really sort of um, still sort of starting this, but um, we have a, a, a website. A website called uh, Map. Um, so if you Google Mousetrap UWO for Western, you find or or a website uh, that shows that you know sort of abilities we have. Uh, we will uh, do uh, consultations to do a fee for service type of thing, but it has to be sort of aligned. We interested in, uh, but we do have the possibility of doing sort of fee for service, uh, even though we, like I said, you know we're well right now and, and sort of overwhelmed, but you know, if there is something that is really sort of uh, um, theory problem that members of Parkinson's disease field, then we have, for example, connections with major consortia like Model AD and other consortia. So if there is a really uh, a pressing drug, uh, we could divert uh, efforts to test that in our pipeline and, and move on to the pipeline of those which we want to see as well. Thank you so much. And we have a couple other questions coming in. How do you think other chaperones such as HSP90 participate in the succulinicopathies? Sorry about that. Yeah. 
Sorry, neuropathies. Yeah, yeah. So HSP9 is the major chaperone. It, it obviously, from for more data, it, it does have an important uh, effect. We we think that is sort of this hub of the epi chaperone, and and on this particular drug that we are testing, um, drug that actually uh, interacts with the conformation of uh, heat shock protein 90 that is involved in uh, um, in this epi chaperone. So, so we do think that is is a it's an interesting target. People have been looking at this for quite a while, but not in the context of chaperone being regulated. And targeting this regulated chaperones might be a, a, a sort of what we think might be one of the viable approaches. I mean, there is certainly other approaches that people are using monoclonal antibodies against misfolded proteins, and, and they're helping different companies to test those as well. Thank you very much. And we have one final question coming in. How long does it take train mice in touch screen cognitive tests? Yeah, so uh, obviously it takes a while. Uh, 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 the mice need to be um, uh, uh, first, you know, they have to have the touch screens, they have to learn to, you know, it's not like humans that you just give, you know, when the human test, we give the touch screen and let them figure out. In a mouse test, we do the same. But we coach the mouse to, you know, first they have to learn, they have to touch the screen and, and, and we want the eventually type of test that we're going to do. And, and there is more, like I said, 30 tests that test different cognitive domains. Uh, I showed reversal learning, but we can test attention, we can test a memory and learning. Um, it takes about, you know, the task, it takes about 15 days to train them to use the touch screens, and it may take about 15 more days to, to a month to, to do the cognitive test. That so it takes about a month uh, to, to get this going, obviously, but you know, it, if you have the capacity, and in our case, we have the capacity, you can do it in multiple different touch screen uh, chambers. So, like I said, we test about you know, 500 to 800 mice every day. And this is also a, a technology that allows us to do a lot of neurotech so we can manipulate, you know, I know you are part of the brain initiative. Uh, there is a lot of discussion. So using optogenetics, uh, using uh, uh, genetics with the stat screens is really easy because everything is time stamped and automated. And on top of everything, we can use other neurotech such as recording with miniscopes or, or five photometry. So Recording neurotransmitters, recording calcium uh, changes in the neuron—all that can be also adapted with the use of this sensor. Dr. Prado, I want to thank you for your presentation and your time today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks for our audience before we go? No, I just want to thank you for for your uh, patience, for your attention, and, and and again, I want to congratulate you, Susan, and all the women for for the day. For, the, for today and, and you know uh, all the amazing work and amazing contributions that women do for uh, not just for science for humanity thank you and thank you very much and thank you again for your important research before we go i want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand for two years until March 8th, 2025. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.